I go, um, by way of disclosure, uh, the opinions I will present don't represent anyone's uh, but my own, not my employers, certainly not any regulatory agencies or I'm a pathologist, I probably don't even represent other pathologists, and I certainly don't represent oncologists. Um, the other is, is I uh, won't claim to provide much in the way of answers, but hopefully I can provide some pictures and raise some questions for further discussion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, diagnostic tests and biomarkers come in several flavors um, we've discussed already. Um, diagnostic, prognostic, predictive, pharmacodynamic, or surrogate endpoints. Um, the last being particularly interesting sometimes in uh, clinical trials, but also uh, in clinical use, for example, PSA uh, levels um, for monitoring uh, prostate cancer patients. Um, steps in diagnostic test development or biomarker qualification, analytical validation, how well the assay measures the molecular event of interest, range, accuracy, precision, et cetera. <clears throat> Excuse me. Clinical validation, the accuracy and predictability of the assay or, or the strength of the association with the condition of interest, including sensitivity, specificity, cutoffs, PPV, NPV, ROCs, et cetera. Importantly, that this is performed in the intended clinical setting on the sample types that will come from the intended patient population. And there are two things already, patients and samples that sort of represent the same thing, but they're also different. Clinical utility, what is the test useful for, ultimately, when it's gotten to this point? And this uh, depends on the intended use. And uh, this is a, a challenge uh, in defining what clinical utility is, because it can be many different things depending on the setting in which the test is going to be used. Um, basically, is it going to provide value for use in, in healthcare, making treatment decisions by an oncologist in the clinic? Or is it going to be used to support regulatory filings and decision making and product development? So those are two, two different scenarios. And a key thing is, is, does a new test offer anything more than what we have now? Is there a reason why we should change? Why should, why should we adopt a new test? And sometimes this is a very difficult question. There's, there's an idea of diagnostic performance and accuracy that, depending on the test, could be part of clinical validation or it could be part of um, clinical utility, for example, a test for an analyte, a serum potassium, how well it uh, detects serum potassium would be part of the clinical validation. Um, a complex genomic test that has an algorithm that gives a final result that in the clinical development is directly linked to, uh, for example, treatment outcome with a particular drug in a patient population, um, this may in fact be part of the demonstration of clinical utility. To review the clinical um, utility levels of evidence that have been developed and uh, used so far, uh, nearly 20 years ago, an ASCO panel convened and published um, these uh, recommendations for um, levels of evidence for um, tumor markers, uh, the TMUGS tumor marker utility grading system, um, and the uh, levels of evidence raising, or ranging from the highest level, prospective, with the marker being the primary analysis to uh, lower levels, prospective going into retrospective types of studies. And subsequently, this, uh, some uh, of the same authors um, uh, published a paper discussing that this was a little too simplistic, perhaps, and that we had to also consider the samples that are being used to create this evidence and not just the trials itself. And so um, we had levels of evidence relating to how samples are obtained and how the tests are performed in relationship to the patient population. And again, these are prospective, retrospective, um, experimental, observational. And the point being that when we start thinking about performing studies, particularly on archive samples that have been taken from the patient at some point in time, stored, and then they're brought back, that we can get things called retrospective, prospective trials or experimental observational studies. So um, they can be. Uh, a number of things all at one time. So these authors uh, uh, put together an approach for trying to combine um, the sample characteristics and the um, validation study characteristics to put together to create a final level, level of evidence. Um, more recently, the NCCN also convened a task, for it, a task force to uh, address the level of, of evidence issue um, and created categories to help guide the decision making um, for oncologists treating cancer patients. And categories um, ranging again from 1, 2A, 2B, to 3, 
um, depending on the level of evidence available. And these uh, categories are included in the NCCN guidelines. Uh, Janet Woodcock uh, has published uh, uh, an article pointing out the distinction between clinical utility in clinical practice and biomarker qualification in drug development. And biomarker qualification is clinical utility in drug development. Can the evidence from the assay be used in regulatory filings and to support decision making? That's the focus. And the fitness for use in this um, setting is to generate supporting evidence as needed for the um, development and regulatory process associated with drug development. This fitness for use establishes global rather than product specific fitness for use. Product specific might be more in the realm of a companion diagnostic development, a biomarker assay for use with a specific drug, and this might actually be construed to be more directly clinical utility rather than biomarker qualification. And that I did want to point out that CEDAR does have a web page and a program to help folks who are um, involved in this process of biomarker qualification um, uh, as an available resource to guide through this process. This is a figure showing where different types of biomarkers might be employed during various parts of uh, drug development and what the intent of those biomarkers might be. Um, biomarker qualification, again, depending on use, can begin in preclinical development and go all the way to post-marketing situations. Uh, surrogate endpoints may be used um, to or as a basis to submit um, uh, uh, filings for approvals. Um, drug diagnostic co-development, where uh, we had the example of crizotinib uh, uh, raised earlier in ALK testing, a beautiful example, starting very early in preclinical development and the drug and the diagnostic moving along through the process with the intent of a uh, co-approval of both the test and the, uh, the, the drug. And something that we've seen, um, which I have been involved in, it still kind of makes me sweat and gives me the shakes, but um, at least with the case of, for example, KRAS testing in colon cancer, this approach did sort of work, and that is rescue diagnostics or retrofit diagnostics, where the diagnostic happens after the fact. And especially uh, rescue diagnostics makes me a little, uh, a little nervous, because um, if one is on the pathologist team involved in drug development, all of a sudden if there's a, a failing drug, you have a very hot spotlight put on you, and it's not a comfortable place to be. Thinking about aspects of clinical utility that weren't addressed in those um, past formal publications, so needs for test. Can a need to be filled to be defined in terms of a problem to be solved? And uh, could we think of this in, in terms of a formalized approach? And I'm going to bring up root cause analysis as a way of thinking about needs and problems to be solved. Um, quality of test, diagnostic accuracy and reproducibility, we've uh, discussed a little bit. Validation, does it do what it's supposed to do? Moving into utility in a way that fills a clinical need. So understanding what are the clinical needs and what are the barriers to implementation in a clinical setting. And finally, fitness for use, implement, implementability. It's an awkward word um, that uh, I, I kind of raised because it really does focus on how do you get it into the clinic and then usability. Once it's there, how do you use it? So you've got to be able to get it there and you've got to be able to use it. So I wanted to discuss root cause analysis, um, and this uh, I apologize for the wordy slide. It's a method of problem solving that tries to identify the root causes of faults or problems. A root cause is a cause that once removed from the problem fault sequence prevents the und final undesirable event from recurring. When I worked in a central testing lab, this was actually a formal process that our QA department made us go through when we uh, dropped a ball, for example. And we called it root canal analysis, but it really, was, it really was helpful. Some general principles, identifying the factors that result in the harmful outcomes or consequences of past events in order to identify what needs change to prevent recurrence and lessons to be learned. It's performed systematically with conclusions and causes that are backed up by documented evidence. There may be more than one cause. Solutions intend to prevent recurrence at the lowest cost in the simplest way. If there are alternatives that are equally effective, then the simplest or lowest cost approach is preferred. Root causes identified depend on the way that the problem or the event's defined, and this is really important. You need effective problem statements and event descriptions. 
The analysis should establish a sequence of events to understand relationships between causal factors, root causes, and the defined problem. Root cause analysis can help transform a reactive culture that reacts to problems into a forward-looking culture. And finally, root cause analysis is a threat to many cultures and environments. And this actually is very important when thinking about how do we do this. Threats to cultures often meet with resistance. So I, I thought about an example. Um, here's a situation. There are some drugs, for example, uh, pemetrexid, bevacizumab, that are approved for use in non-squamous, non-small cell carcinoma. The problem is, is that the histopathology uh, diagnosis of non-small cell carcinoma is often imprecise and inaccurate. So the solution, create more precise and accurate ways to diagnose non-small cell lung cancer subtypes. Pretty easy. The intended result could be to make better clinical decisions, sure, or maybe change in the label um, of a drug to include a test. But I wanted to look at this more closely. The situation is really that benefit or safety in clinical trials showed some association to histopath subtype. And in fact, if you go back and look at that association, it, uh, there are various levels of evidence uh, uh, supporting that association, depending on the drug and the clinical program. The problem is histopathology um, diagnosis of non-small cell lung cancer can be precise and inaccurate, could lead to misassociation of a diagnosis to an outcome in a clinical trial, or to suboptimal treatment of the patient in the clinic. Um, biologically different tumors well-differentiated versus poorly differentiated may not have the same responses to treatment. We think about adeno versus squamous, but that's not the only biological uh, spectrum that tumors are on. They also have this differentiation spectrum. So we have to think about tumor biology. The causes, accurate and reproducible subtyping can be compromised by sampling, if the sample's too small. Interpretation, the pathologist has a lack of experience. Or by biology, if the tumor is very poorly differentiated, it can be nearly impossible to call it squamous or adenocarcinoma. So solutions depend on the real problem. A new adeno versus squamous cell diagnostics, I would say maybe they would be useful if they make the same call on small biopsies that would have been made on a larger definitive sample of the same tumor. Because the clinical trials were done that way. That's the way the diagnosis was done. So all the clinical evidence supporting the use of this in a, in a clinical situation is based on histopathology diagnosis. Tests that would change the diagnosis of a definitive sample, for example, from undifferentiated carcinoma to squamous cell cancer, might not be useful for treatment decisions unless they were directly evaluated against clinical outcomes or surrogates. So my own opinion. Your fitness for use, this idea of implementability depends on the platform and the assay. Is it suitable? Is it robust? Is it complex? Is it expensive? And laboratory-developed tests can offer flexibility and rapid deployments to serve a need. Uh, Neil Hayes gave a great description about the intent of LDTs. Um, there may not be a, uh, a, a formal development program for the test, um, either planned for whatever reason, or it may not even be possible, depending on the test and the indication. LDTs can serve these purposes. Does the test need a special environment like a special lab to be performed, or can it be done in independent labs sold as a kit? Sample characteristics is the way the sample is acquired, evaluated, processed, part of the test, or do we rely on pre-existing samples that are done routinely, whatever that means, in order to do our testing? And what does that mean from the standpoint of um, the results that we get? And even the sample presentation um, as a histopathologist, we'll talk about immunohistochemistry, for example, tissue-based studies. Tissue microarrays, where a whole bunch of tissue samples are put on one slide, are really, really useful for doing experimental studies. You can do you know, one test on one slide, and you've studied a population. But that also makes them unsuitable for clinical uh, testing. Tissue microarrays can't be used as a clinical test. And so if you're going to validate a slide-based assay, it really has to be done on single slides, not tissue microarrays, before you've shown that it really can be useful. And uh, interpretation, what's the process of interpretation? What does that report look like? Is there a process for robust, reliable, reproducible interpretation and analysis of the data to deliver the final result to the clinician? And this result is really what ends up having to have the clinical utility. Whatever it is that's passed off to the clinician has to have the utility. 
So is how do you give the result part of the report, or do we presume it to be common knowledge, or do we just avoid it? Um, I have a friend who, um, he's my age, and he was recently diagnosed with undifferentiated sinonasal carcinoma, metastatic stage four. And uh, he had a forward-looking oncologist, he has a forward-looking oncologist, who immediately ordered Foundation One testing on him and then started him on uh, carboplatin 5-FU, kind of standard for that indication. And he's gone through five cycles of that, <clears throat> got the Foundation One report back, and he shared it with me. And uh, the Foundation One report has uh, he has a mutation in SDK11 or LKV1, which is linked to the AKT mTOR pathway. And there's a mutation in BRCA2 also. And uh, this may have an association with, um, with PARP inhibitor use. And so these were ideas of drugs, targeted therapies that were linked by pathway um, or a gene to uh, you know, a couple of uh, non-standard of care drugs. And uh, so I asked him what he was going to do with this, and he said, well, we're looking to put him on a uh, clinical trial of Aurora kinase inhibitors. And I asked why, and they said, or the oncologist said, because uh, Aurora kinase inhibitors have shown some efficacy in small cell cancer. So there was some disconnect between ordering and getting the Foundation One report and getting those results with some recommendation of a targeted therapy that could be used that, for whatever reason, the oncologist did not act on that report. So... There was something that wasn't clinically, you know, it wasn't strong enough to drive that oncologist to use that information. One aspect of fitness for use is how big is the gray zone in an assay result? Gray zones can be technical, lack of precision. If the data is continuous variables, you know, where's the threshold, where's the cutoff? Even if it's discontinuous, like uh, uh, mutation calling, is it an A or is it a G? It seems like it should be easy, but actually, as was discussed earlier, this uh, requires multiple, multiple reads in order to generate the statistical strength to actually say, yes, it is a G, yes, it is an A. And even so, you know, seemingly black and white data, like a mutation, can still have gray zones in the levels of evidence to support a decision. And gray zones can be due to lack of clear definitions or incomplete situational analyses. What do we want? What do we have? What do we do? I wanted to give a few examples. HER2 IHC. If it's in the gray zone, 2 plus, it's an equivocal, um, uh, equivocal result. The uh, guidelines are to reflex it to a new test, either retest by IHC or use a different test, use a fish test that may give a more um, firm answer. Um, Oncotype DX, a genomic gene expression assay, has a zone called intermediate. Of variants of uncertain significance identified by next-gen sequencing. You know, Bruce earlier talked about the EGFR mutations. There are specific ones that are category one uh, levels of evidence to be linked to sensitivity to uh, receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But there are other EGFR tyrosine kinase domain mutations that are linked to resistance to treatment. So if we have a variant of unknown significance, a novel or a rare variant in the TKD even of the EGFR, what should we tell the oncologist? Here's an example of the uh, genomic health intermediate range. This is the data from NSAB P20, and the percentages are showing the number of patients in the study that fell into each one of those categories. So fairly good spread, 54, 21, 25 percent across the low, intermediate, and high-risk categories. And uh, this uh, uh, test is widely used clinically. But what if the patient population had fell out this way, that 80 percent were in the intermediate range? Would this test still have clinical utility? Now, what are the magic numbers that would bring people to say, this is a useful test? And finally, I'd like to wrap up just kind of pointing out or taking a look at different tests that are aimed at doing the same thing. So it would seem as though the clinical utility proposition would be the same for these three tests. But is it? And if it isn't, what are the differences? So this is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma um, subtyping. And uh, this was originally done. I'm going to talk about three different tests here. This was originally discovered um, using gene expression uh, profiling on microarrays. And uh, there was a gene signature that divided uh, DLBCLs into germinal center B-cell-like or activated B-cell-like um, categories. 
So um, these have prognostic significance, and uh, there's a lot of clinical interest around uh, these subtyping. So why isn't this the clinical test? Well, it needed frozen samples for gene expression arrays, complex technology, uh, difficult to implement in a testing lab. There's a nice thing about this signature is there's strength in numbers. You've got thousands of genes. If you have dropout of one of the genes, it's like not a big deal because you've got a signature. So that's a strong point of that approach. In an attempt to develop this into something that would be more clinically usable, um, uh, some authors have developed decision tree algorithms for immunohistochemistry. And this is very different. It's still a gene panel, but the way they relate to each other is different. It's a stepwise decision tree algorithm. So this can be performed on formalin fixed paraffin embedded samples. It's a simple technology, although the interpretation of IHC may not be that simple. However, each gene, by contrast to the last case, has to stand alone. So if one of them fails, then the whole decision tree kind of breaks down. So that's an issue. And uh, more recently, um, a group here, Mickey Williams, uh, who spoke earlier as part of this group, uh, published a gene expression assay on the nanostring platform. And this is a panel of 15 test genes and five housekeeping genes. Um, with great performance, and our chematopathologists at UNC think that this is actually going to be the way forward clinically um, uh, for this problem. Um, this uh, can be used on, sorry, I have frozen samples. This should be FFPE samples. However, it is a complex technology. This nanostring instrument is kind of a locked box, but that may be a good thing because the model is locked and it includes things like the gene coefficients, thresholds, quality criteria, et cetera. So three different types of tests all aimed at doing the same thing. Why is one good? Why is one bad? Why is one usable? Why is one not? And finally, I wanted to wrap up with the IHC approach. This is an actual experience that I was involved in of trying to implement this into a uh, clinical development program. Um, we used uh, the uh, the Hans criteria or the Choi criteria differ in the number of genes in the panel for doing um, a subtyping of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And so this is what the program or the strategy that we put together looked like. And I thought it was nice for what we were trying to do here. First part, assay optimization and technical validation. Three separate laboratories performed the panel on a tissue microarray um, of samples that had gene expression data, so we knew what the gold standard subtyping was. We performed the usual um, reproducibility, variation, et cetera, analyses. The clinical evaluation, then we repeated the assays on actual individual tissue sections from a phase two trial. So this is the way samples would be received in clinical testing. This was done independently and blinded in each lab. We fine-tuned the interpretation, the actual uh, performance protocols, et cetera, and took that then to the um, demonstration of clinical utility, where the trans we transferred the lockdown test protocol to a central lab um, for use in a prospective fashion in a registrational study to stratify or select patients. Um, as David um, uh, discussed in the last talk, we discussed uh, the co-development imp and implementation path with the FDA, and this could form the basis for simultaneous approval of the drug and the companion diagnostic. So. Uh, with that, I'll wrap up, and I thank you very much for your attention.